Hi hey everybody, I'm Kate Hearn. Welcome um, for this webinar called Bringing AAC Home. Today we're going to be talking about what to do once your daughter has an AAC system, be that a high-tech system like a Toby or a PRC, um, Echo or Accent device, or a lower tech system such as a pod or another um, system that allows your child access to full communication. So today we're gonna look at what can we do in our homes so that we can um, have everything we need for our daughters to learn how to communicate. So um, quickly, the videos and photos in here um, are the uh, belong to those who are in the pictures and please don't um, copy them or save them. So the first thing we're going to talk about is presuming um, competence, or what's called the least dangerous assumption. So the least dangerous assumption is when we assume that um, our daughters can um, learn and are fully competent and capable of participating in all areas of life. In full, the least dangerous assumption is the premise that in the absence of other evidence, we believe that we have not yet found a way to make it so a child or adult with a disability can, instead of believing that they can't. So this is instead of looking at a child who has significant disabilities and thinking, you know, their bodies are very complex, they're non-speaking, um, they have other medical problems, clearly they won't be able to learn, so we won't teach them to communicate or we won't teach them to read and write or we won't let them be part of the community. Um, instead of thinking that, we think, we don't know what the potential is here. And if we make a mistake and treat the child as if there is less potential than there really is, then we will be hurting that child. So first, we do no harm. We assume that the child can learn to read and write and communicate and participate because we don't want to be in the position of someday wondering what if. And if, you know, if somebody that child writes a book, we know we want to be in the chapter where they write about people who believed in them and not in any other chapter. And that brings us to the Communication Bill of Rights. The Communication Bill of Rights was created by TASH, which is a group of um, people who support those with significant disabilities and people with significant disabilities themselves and ASHA, which the American, is the American Speech and Hearing Association. The Communication Bill of Rights enumerates those things which are basic rights for people who are non-speaking or use alternative communication. This is something you should be sharing with your daughter's IEP teams and everybody in her life. It really enumerates for, for us all those things we need to be thinking about. So the first thing is making real choices. If the only choice your daughter ever has is a choice between the red and the blue crayon, or does she want to wear her hair down or wear her hair up, or does she want to eat her banana and then her crackers, or her crackers and then her banana, those aren't real choices in life. They're not meaningful. Um, there is real power in choice making, but not in these sort of fake, situations that, that people create to see if your daughter can make a choice. Those things are tests and they're, they're not communication. So making real choices um, that are age appropriate about their lives. So if your daughter is 13, she should be making decisions about who her friends are, about who she's going to connect with on social networking, about what she wants to read, about what she wants to write about about what she wants to eat. But if your daughter is three or four, then the choices are more limited. It might be what TV show does she want to watch um, or what color sweater does she want to wear that day. The next thing is the right to refuse, to reject, and to say no. This is essential for all individuals, especially those with communication disabilities. This is the right to be given applesauce and, and to somehow communicate, I, I don't want that. Um, and to say no. So if somebody says to your daughter, you know, come outside with me, they can say no, I, I don't want to. 
Now, there are, of course, times when we can't let them refuse or reject or say no. They can't refuse medication. They can't refuse things like hygiene. Um, but they have the right to, to reject it and to say no and then to be have that conversation about, I understand you don't want to take a bath right now, but it's not a choice. We're going to take a bath right now. Um, the right to ask for what I want. So this might be that your daughter is asking for tacos at 6 in the morning or is asking to watch the Door of the Explorer show for six hours straight. That they have the right to ask for what they want. Doesn't mean you have to give it to them, but it does mean they have the right to ask. Of course, the fastest way to teach a child that their communication has meaning is to honor their requests, which means for the first few months they have a, a speech system or a communication system, you might be watching, you know, a little more Dora than you want to. Um, but eventually it becomes a situation where they understand that sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes the answer is no. The right to share feelings. One thing that girls with Rett syndrome and adults with Rett syndrome are really good at doing is sharing their feelings. Um, of all the girls I've worked with, they all do very well saying when they're mad or when they're sad or when their feelings are hurt or when they're happy or excited. Um, so the ability to share feelings is essential and to have those feelings be, be heard. Um, being heard and responded to even in the, if the answer is no is also one of those rights that people have. Um, you know, I can go and I can, um, as an adult, I can go to the registry and say, you know, I want you to give me my, my car registration for free. And the person is going to say, um, no, you owe me whatever amount of money car registrations are going for right now. But I was answered and I was heard. Um, so that means we're not going to ignore girls when they or take away their words or turn off a button on, on their speech device if they ask for something they can't have. It means that the, they're, we're going to say, yes, we know you want that. You've asked a thousand times. You can't have it right now. The right to ask for and get attention and interaction. One of the things that I hated the most when I was teaching was I would run into people who would say, oh, they just want attention. And the, the logical extrapolation from that seemed to always be, we'll ignore them. And my answer was always, you know, yes, they, they do just want attention. And now that they have our attention, what are we going to do to be better teachers? Um, so the girls have a right to, to ask for attention and true interaction. Um, you know, and sometimes it may not be the right time. And again, you may say, you know, I'll spend 20 minutes with you later, but right now I have to put the groceries away. Um, but being able to ask and get attention in an appropriate way um, is so essential to making sure that our girls can get their needs met. The next is really very important, and you as a parent are the one who's going to have to advocate for this all the time. It's really going to be your job. And that's for your child to have and you use their AAC or speech system all of the time. So that means that you find a way for them to communicate even in places where it's really hard to communicate. So, you know, being able to communicate when you're sitting on your desk at school is really important or at the dinner table at home is really important, but it's just as important to have a way to communicate in the bathtub, in the swimming pool, and to be able to communicate at the shopping mall and at assembly um, and all the other places kids need to communicate. That doesn't mean that a high-tech speech device has to be the way in the bathtub. Obviously, it's not going to work to bring a very expensive computer into the tub, um, but it means that you have to be thinking about this and you have to set up a way for them to be able to communicate. So a low-tech book, a spelling flip book, some way um, for them to be able to communicate what they need and what they want um, and what their thoughts and feelings are in places where it's harder to use a speech device. The next point is um, the ability to know and ask about my schedule. Once upon a time, I went in to um, evaluate a young lady who had Rett syndrome, and at the time was about 11. And in her classroom, there was no schedule hanging on the wall, and nobody seemed to be talking to her about the schedule. 
It was a Friday afternoon and the classroom um, was watching videos, which is something we can talk about at another time as it's not always the best use of a classroom time to watch a video that's not tied to the curriculum. Um, so, but this young lady was watching the videos and was pretty happy with that. And then she was taken to the restroom and nobody said to her, when you get back from the restroom, this TV is going to be off and you're going to get ready to go home. So when she returned from the restroom, she was very upset and she was yelling and crying because she didn't know that the show she was watching was going to be turned off. Nobody told her. Um, and, you know, all of us in life like to know our schedule. We like to know what's going to happen next. Um, and that's it's really important for the girls to know what the schedule is and to ask questions, you know. When are we going to have a break? Um, when is this going to be over? When do I get to see this friend again? Those sorts of things are, are really important for them to be able to use their device for. Next is the right to be taught how to communicate. It's not enough to put a speech device or put a communication book in front of a child and expect them to know how to use it. Learning to use one of these systems is like learning a foreign language. I'm pretty sure that all of us watching this who grew up in the United States spent four years in a foreign language classroom, 45 minutes a day, for 180 days a year, and most of us are not fluent. Most of us don't even remember the rudimentary parts of the foreign language we studied. Those of us who are able to communicate fluently in a second language either grow up, grew up speaking two languages or did some time where we were immersed in the second language, where we went to that country and lived there, or we worked in an environment here in the United States where we need to speak that language all day long, and we heard that language all day long. And that's what our girls need to have to be able to use their speech devices. We have to teach them how to communicate by immersing them in the language of their system. People who have speech disorders and use AAC have the right to be a full member of their community. This doesn't mean that they only go to Challenger Baseball or that they're taken for walks outside in their wheelchair while the other children are on the playground. This means that we find ways for active participation in all of the activities that are age appropriate for that child. This is going to mean that we're going to have to be very creative and we're going to have to really do some problem solving to figure out how we're going to make them a member of their community and what the next steps are. Um, next, the children deserve a right to be treated with, and, and adults too, to be treated with respect and dignity. So that means no patronizing voices, no pats on the head, um, no rubbing their shoulders without permission, um, no talking about them in front of them like they're not there, um, all of the things that go along with being treated respectfully, being allowed to give opinions, being asked what they want, all the pieces of respect and dignity, not having their medical or personal problems or habits spoken about with others out of turn, um, not having somebody walk through the school holding a diaper um, outside of a bag so that everybody can see where they're going and what they're going to be doing. Um, you know, a lot of these things, sometimes you have to really think about, is that dignified before you allow it? Um, even things like, how is the child loaded into or placed on the bus? Are they facing a different direction than somebody else? Um, are they in the back of the bus where everybody else is sitting in the front of the bus? Do so they get to choose who sits near them on the bus? These sorts of things that, you know, when you're nine or ten, who you sit with on the bus is a matter of huge importance. Um, and it's respectful to make sure that our girls who use their speech devices have these, these same respectful and dignified exchanges and choices in their lives. Um, to be spoken to and not about. This happens all the time in medical settings, in schools, in families, where people who are verbal speak about the third person who is not verbal in front of them without involving them or engaging them. 
it is vitally important that you train yourself to never ever do this. If you're going to speak about someone who is in the room, then you include them in the conversation. You also don't go out of the room to discuss something that that child should be part of making a decision about or at the very least should know about. And finally, it's the right to be treated and communicated with in a sensitive manner. And that doesn't just mean that we're being polite. That means things like we respect the fact that if they're having seizures, we need to slow down and be more clear because they may be having trouble following. Or it might mean that we allow a very long wait time for them to process what they're hearing and create their reply on their speech device. Sensitivity varies um, based on what student needs are, and I know that with work we can all make sure that we are communicating with individuals who use speech devices in a sensitive way. This Communication Bill of Rights can be found online if you Google it. There are many different versions and copies out there, but they all have the same basic facts on it. I recommend you print it, put it on your refrigerator, put it in the clear cover on your child's binder. Um, find ways to make, make it so people are really thinking about this. Bring it to your IEP meeting and ask it to be, to be attached to the IEP. Um, make sure it's on the top of people's minds when they're thinking about your daughter and her communication. So what do we want? How do, how, do, how do we as families and how do professionals help implement AAC at home? Um, so the first thing is we set small goals that work towards full-time communication system use. And this means that you start where you are. If right now your daughter's system doesn't even come home from school, you start by having it brought home. If right now you only take it out of the bag on the weekend, maybe it means that you start taking it out after school every day. And then you work up to setting it up every day and turning it on. If you're wonderful at using it at home right now, but you never take it out in the community with you, maybe that's your next step. It's figuring out which communication system is gonna work when you're on the go and how you're gonna make that happen. Are you gonna use a book or a high-tech device? Are you gonna use partner-assisted scanning, which is when a human being reads the choices on the screen or in the book and the child tells you yes or no in whatever way she can? Or are you gonna actually use your high-tech system? Um, you're going to start where you are and move forward, heading towards your child always having access to their communication no matter where they are. And then we're going to break it down into things we can do. If you watch this webinar and you decide starting immediately, you're going to start modeling their device every minute of every day, three days from now, you're going to feel stuck and you're going to feel like you did something wrong and you're going to feel disappointed with yourself. You have to start where you are and break it down. If right now you decide you're not doing enough modeling, so you pick one time a day where things are pretty calm where you're going to do some modeling and you start doing that, that's a lot better than having huge plans that you aren't able to implement because you bit off more than you can chew. So if right now you decide that bedtime is a relatively calm time in your house, and I know for some of you it probably isn't, um, but pick the thing that's a relatively calm time. And you're going to model three or four sentences, and we'll talk about what that means in a little while. Um, then you set out to do that. You may have to set out some rewards for yourself. I know some families who have little modeling competitions. Winner has to, um, winner gets out of their chores for a week, and everybody else has to pick up their slack, do the dishes, and so forth. Um, it's important that you know as parents that you can do this. You have the skills already to teach language. If you have other children, you taught those children language. And you did it without any special training, without any help, you taught your child to talk. It's the same thing with AAC. You already have the skills to do it. They're just accessing that language in a different way. So when you think of you having a baby in front of you and saying to that baby the name of everything they look at, so they look out the window and you say, oh, you're looking out the window. <gasps> Did you hear that? That's a big truck. That was you teaching your child language without even knowing you were doing it. You're going to do the same thing with your alternative communication user. If you're looking out the window and there's a truck, you're going to use the system to say, Look, window, truck, loud. 
and work up to having fuller language. You're not going to know how to speak this language magically. It takes time to learn how it goes. We're going to motivate, model, and move out of the way. That means that we're going to find motivating activities in which to embed language. We are going to use the devices ourselves to teach the language, and then we are going to give our children the space to communicate. That might mean physically backing up, and it might mean giving them more time, and we'll talk about that. You're going to want to get some AAC training in person or online. Obviously, if you're taking this webinar, you figure that piece out a little bit, but look for all the opportunities you can find to get some training and to get support from others in your position. There's lots of social networking groups, probably one specific to the system that your child uses, be it a Toby or an Accent or a Pod book. So you can join support groups for that. And then there are lots of support groups online on Facebook and in other social sites for you know, communicating with children who have read or communicating with preschoolers who have read. Um, so look for those and join in. And then you're going to track success. And you're going to do that so you have something to turn to when things get hard, because they will get hard. There are going to be days when your daughter says nothing and you feel frustrated and you're wondering if you're doing the right thing. There are going to be days when you think about throwing the device out the window. If you have a notebook or if you've texted yourself all of the amazing things that your daughter has started to say, you can look back and remember that you are having success, that your daughter is learning. Rome wasn't built in a day, um, but if you don't keep track of all the bricks that you've laid, it's easy to get discouraged. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about a little bit more in the webinar. But first, let's talk a little bit about apraxia. So apraxia is a key component of Rett syndrome. I'm yet to meet a girl with Rett um, or a boy with Rett for the couple of boys that I've met that don't have apraxia. So apraxia is the inability to perform a task, especially speech, even though the request is understood, there is a willingness to do the task, the muscles work properly, and the task has been learned. So yesterday you said to your daughter, look at the picture of the cow, and she looked at the picture of the cow. Today you say to your daughter, look at the picture of the cow, and she's not able to do it. She didn't forget, she's not ignoring you. Well, she might be ignoring you, depending on your daughter, um, but usually she's not ignoring you. She's probably not refusing or acting out. She's just living with apraxia, and some days apraxia wins. Some days those messages just don't get from the brain to the body, be that to their eyes to use a device, to their hands to touch buttons, or to their mouth to form words. Um, you can assume that the more the girl wants to do this thing, the harder it's going to be. Um, so one thing you can always count on is the girl with RET will be consistently inconsistent. And that's not because of intelligence and they're not badly behaved. It's not a behavior problem. It's not sensory. It's simply apraxia. They will be consistently inconsistent. So instead of looking at specific incidents where you're trying to track increasing from 70% accuracy to 80% accuracy, you're looking for trends. You're looking for the overall idea that your child is moving from a less understanding of whatever it is you're talking about to more understanding. I uh, know that a sudden burst of strong emotion, be that excitement and happiness, or be that anger or overwhelming sadness, that may override apraxia. So if your daughter is very, very happy or very, very sad or very, very mad, she may be able to say a word or point to a word or use her device to say a word with much more ease. Um, but that doesn't usually last. And since we can't measure your daughter's knowledge because of the combination of her hand stereotypes, be it hand wringing or clapping or hand mouthing, and the apraxia, even with eye gaze technology, you really have to assume that your daughter is competent. You have to believe that she is bright and she is learning. Because if we decide that she has a developmental disability and treat her that way, we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, 
as you know, educational neglect is something that used to happen and still happens a lot. This is when, you know, you take a child who you, who people say, you know, they aren't going to learn or they won't learn much or they'll never get past an X year old level. And because you believe that, you don't give them any other input or teaching that's beyond that. And you've, you know, you've created a child now who has a developmental disability who may not have had one otherwise or may not have had such a significant developmental disability. So we treat the girls as if they can and as if they fully understand. Um, and lots of times they prove us right. I, I would say most of the girls I work with prove us right, that they do understand and that they can learn. So let's break it down a little bit. First of all, more is more. We start with a robust vocabulary and we keep it growing. If your daughter is doing a choice of two or four or six or eight, it's not enough words. You have to have words to prove you can use words. Your daughter is going to be consistently inconsistent. So if you wait for 80% accuracy from a field of two or four or six of, or eight, you shall never get to have more words. You need to give her as much language as she can physically access and then keep adding to it. You need to set up the device and then forget it. And I don't mean forget it's there and stop using it. I mean set it up and take the focus off it. Don't keep saying things like tell me this or tell me that or asking questions that demand she organize her body and answer you. I mean integrate the device naturally and keep the focus on the interaction. And finally, you're going to motivate, model, and move out of the way. So set it and forget it. More, more accurately, we would say set it and take the focus off of it. The device should be there. It should be ready. Your daughter should have access. You should have access to model. Um, but remember, it's a tool. It's your child's voice, but it's not the point. The point of your child having a device is interaction and connection. You know, when they've done studies with infants um, and the infant looks at the mother and the mother looks at the child and is smiling and interactive and then the mother does a blank face. Babies will do everything in their power as infants to bring back their smiling mother with an animated face. We are all internally genetically driven to connect with other human beings. That's what this device or book is all about. It isn't about find the picture of the cat or tell me what you want to eat or tell me how you feel. It's about connecting and interaction. So you need to keep the focus on that. Using the device to communicate and connect about everything and anything people would speak about. The more you focus on the device, the less motivating communication is going to be. So don't talk about the device. Don't say, tell me this, or point to that, or show me this. You use the device to model it. Um, so you're going to want to set up a very motivating activity if you want to get the most out of communication. So you might want to focus on those things that your daughter thinks is fun, be that reading books, watching videos, arts and crafts, interacting with relatives and grandparents, going to parties, watching a, their sister's basketball game, whatever's going on that your daughter enjoys or loves, that's when you want to bust out the communication and start focusing on communicating with your daughter in her language about that activity. If you're just sitting around the dinner table, don't force the child to say, pass the peas, or I want more milk, please. Tell jokes, tell about your day, and encourage your daughter to comment. You know, if, if your son's making rude belching noises, you can encourage your daughter to scold him and model that on the device by you saying it with the device, or you can laugh and say that he's funny with the device, whatever your family values are. Um, you're going to focus on comments and descriptions. You don't want this to be a quiz. If you make communication into a quiz, your child isn't going to want to communicate. Imagine your life as a multiple choice test every minute of every day. We don't want that. We want communication. So we have to focus on not asking direct questions and instead setting up communication interactions that are as irresistible as possible. And then we're going to model. 
So to paraphrase Linda Burkhart, who um, does a lot of work with pod books, language in equals language out. We want our daughters to talk to us with these symbol-based languages, so we are going to talk to them in the symbol-based language. We need to say everything that we say to them as much as possible with our voices and with their device. This is called aided language stimulation or aided language input, um, but basically it's that immersion we talked about earlier. It's that idea that none of us learned a foreign language an hour a day, five days a week, 180 days a year for four years. That didn't work. So even if you sat down and did an hour a day of speech time with your daughter, you're probably not going to end up with a fluent communicator. But if you immerse your daughter in that language, if your whole family becomes a family that speaks Pod or Sonoflex or Unity or Toby or PRC or whatever language system you're using, if you become a family that speaks that language, then your daughter will become somebody who speaks that language. You need to use the device. You need to have your other children use the device. Have visitors use the device. If you can possibly have two copies of the device, you should do that and have everybody using it. While you're activating the device, you're also communicating it with your voice. If you want to say to your daughter, that was awesome, you can say with your voice, that was awesome, and then press the button awesome. When you get better at the device, you might say, it awesome. When you're even better than that, you might say, it was awesome. You want to tell someone to shush? Then you use that device. You use your mouth and say, please be quiet. And you use the device to say quiet or quiet please or you be quiet. You're going to show them how to use the AAC system to communicate. This is where you're going to do what every parent does to teach their child language. And that is you're going to speak to your child in that language. When you bring an infant home from a hospital, how long do you talk to them before you expect them to talk back? A week? Talk to them for a month? Yeah, I've been talking to this baby for a month. She hasn't said a word. I'm going to stop. Six months? A year? We talk to babies for two years, 18 to 24 months, before we expect anything real back from them. It takes them a long time to hear all our language, learn how to understand it, and then give it back to us in a meaningful way. Your child who uses a speech device deserves the same. Dedicate yourself to 18 to 24 months of modeling. My guess is you'll see your response much faster, but keep up the modeling even after that so your daughter will become a competent communicator. One of the things to remember is you do not need to model every word that you say. What you want to think about is the zone of proximal development. So if you picture a donut, the middle of the donut, the hole, is what your child knows. The actual donut part is the area where your child is capable of learning. It's one step out. The rest of the plate, the rest of the world beyond the donut, we're not there yet. So if your child in her inner circle inside the donut, if she's just saying one word to communicate, you want to be in the zone of proximal development and you want to be saying two words. If she's just saying things like like, then you want to be modeling things like I like or like it. Um, do not go making long full sentences if your daughter is only using one or two or three words. You're going to model just one word more than what your daughter typically says. If she moves up to two words, you move up to modeling three. And you're just going to model the key words. Don't worry about verb tenses. Don't worry about making sure you have the right ending on your adjective or adverb at the beginning. That's not where you're, where you're at yet. That's not in the zone of proximal development. Just focus on modeling those keywords and increasing the number as your child increases. You've got this, moms and dads. You've got this. You can do this modeling piece. 
It will take a while. You'll get frustrated. It'll be hard, but you can do this. Another important thing to remember is to talk out loud when you cannot find a word. If you can't find a word in their device, then out loud work through the process of where they should find the word. You know, oh, I want to say that this food is hot. I'm not finding the word hot in the food pages. I wonder where else I could look. You know what? I'm going to look under descriptions. Okay, I don't see anything for how food tastes here. I'm going to try weather because sometimes people say hot about the weather. There it is, the word hot. This food is hot. If you can't find a word at all, you're going to model going into the child's spelling pages and spelling the word. So let's say you went to weather and hot wasn't there and you said hot isn't under weather e either. I can't find it. I think it's time for me to spell it. Every good robust system has a spelling page. So go to the spelling page and start to show them how to spell it. Hot. H makes the H sound. H. If it's a high-tech device, you may well put in the H and the word hot will come up on word prediction. If it's a low-tech device, you can keep sounding it out. But you want to model all of these things, not just the language, but also the problem solving and the spelling if you can't find a word because your daughter will learn by watching you. That's how kids learn. And next, you're going to move out of the way. You're going to leave the device set up. There's no such thing as device time being over or being too tired. You shouldn't flip a cloth over the screen so they can't use it anymore. Just teach your daughter that if she's tired, she can look away and to ignore the device if she doesn't feel like talking, but it's there if she needs it. Um, remember, everyone has a right to a voice all the time. You need to bring the device with you wherever you go, and if you can't do that because it's too big or heavy or you have too much to carry, you need to bring some kind of low-tech backup system. Remember, all devices break, so you need a backup system, a paper-based spelling or picture-based system that you can use if you can't bring that high-tech device with you. Moving out of the way means that you're going to let life happen. You're going to leave your child with her device watching TV and then maybe see what she says. Does she comment on the TV show? Does she tell you to change the channel? If your child has a high-tech enough device where they can change the channel themselves, you might find out that they're not into Dora anymore and they want to watch Ellen. Um, you're going to you know, be ready. You might find out that you know, your daughter tells your son that he's mean when he interrupts her. You need to let that happen so you can find out more about your daughter. And you need to encourage your child to talk to yourself, talk to themselves. You can give them a button that says, I'm just exploring, or if they start just saying a lot when nobody's really around them, you can ask them, are you just talking to yourself? You are? Okay, that's fine. You know, look at me and say my name if you need me to come listen. Um, but talking to yourself is a, is a valuable piece of communication. It's a way that the girls learn where things are by just exploring and looking around. Another thing to think about is to increase vocabulary before you need it. If there's nothing to say, then your daughter's not going to say anything. You need to start somewhere where, between where you think they are and where they should be in their wildest dreams. Notice that nothing I put on the screen here has three buttons or four buttons or even nine buttons. Your daughter needs enough buttons to be able to have all the words that she needs. Okay. You can't have a life where all you can say is potty, cookie, more, and goodbye. You need a life where you have access to all the words that you, mean, you need. Your girls don't need to be taught a word or to know how to find and say a word for them to be able to have it on their device. That's some old thinking. We used to think kids need to prove they understood a word before we would give it to them. We don't do that with typically developing kids. They don't have to prove they understand a word before we'll allow them to try to say it or before we'll say it to them. Also remember that the more buttons on a page, the less page turning you're going to need. And that's true for both books and high-tech devices. If you only have 15 buttons on a page 
it's going to take twice as many hits to get to the word you need as having 30 buttons on a page. That's just math. So give your daughter as many buttons as she can physically access and see. And then worry about how are you going to teach all those words. Trust me, it'll come more naturally than you think. I'm yet to have a girl with Rett syndrome, and I've worked with quite a few, disappoint me in terms of being able to figure out the robust vocabulary system. Do they know at the end of the first month? No. But the end of four or five years? Yes. They're able to communicate. A lot of Rett girls aren't chatty. They don't chit chat and just joke around, but they know what to say and how to say it when it's important. Be it important for emotional reasons or physical reasons, they are able to say what they need to say. So have that vocabulary there for them. Believe in your daughter. Believe she can do more. Believe she's capable of having 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 100 things on a page based on how accurate her eye gaze is. Um, adjust the settings before you take away words. Um, you know, increase the dwell time, decrease the dwell time. There are lots of great webinars on here and more to come that will talk about those things. But you want to have as many words as the girl can physically handle in front of her as far as access. Next you want to think about setting up a communication rich home environment. So that means first and foremost the device is on and ready to be used um, at all times and like I said earlier you might have to build up to that. Don't expect to magically fix that immediately. That means all family members use the system when talking to the user. Everybody's modeling. Um, and then you can take it a couple steps further. You can label everything in your house, not just with the name of the noun, which isn't that important, but with core words. Core words are what I call recyclable words. Those are the words that your daughter can use over and over and over again in many different contexts, in many different settings and environments. Core words are words that make up 80% of what we say. Words like in and on and the and over and come and go and show and stop and bring and carry and pretty and ugly and like and don't like. Those are the words that you're going to want to make sure your daughter has because she'll need them so frequently in so many different places. Whereas she's only going to need salad dressing at dinner when there's salad. So if you're going to prioritize, prioritize the word she's going to need the most. When you label your house, you can put the word door on the door to help your daughter understand that's the symbol for the thing, but also put the core words that go with door, in, out, open, close, and phrases that are important when you're going near a door. Hello, goodbye, I'm leaving. Um, in that way, you can really make your home a learning environment even when you're not working on communication. You can also get posters made of your daughter's communication main page or you can make a low-tech book and hang the pages that are specific to an environment in that environment. So if your daughter has a page where she can talk about bath time or being in the tub, then you can print that and laminate it and have it in the tub. So you can model communication there and use partner assisted scanning which is where you point to each item and give the child a chance to say if that's what they want while they're in the bathtub or in the swimming pool or whatever other environment you might need that kind of backup system. Go through your house and see if there are ways that you could add communication to things that are already happening in the house. Um, you know, how can you have more communication at dinner time? How can you, you know, when your child takes their things, when you empty her backpack, could she be with you? Could you put her on the page in her device that's about, you know, showing you what's in her bag and then model, you know, I'm going to open your bag. Let's look in your bag. What is this? So that she's able to have language for all those pieces of her life. The next thing to think about is really involving siblings. You know, kids are so much more tech savvy than we adults do because they've grown up in this world where technology just works for them all the time. They've never lost their term paper or deleted their dissertation or, you know, had the dog eat the floppy disk or any of those things that some of us went through. So kids aren't afraid of technology. So you can harness that. 
They're not going to be afraid of the, the speech device if that's what you're using. Teach the kids how to model on the device and ask them what kind of words your child needs. You know, I had a, a brother, an older brother, pull me aside recently and tell me that I, I needed to go through the speech system and take out the word preschool. Um, and I said, okay, I'll take it out and I'll put in kindergarten. And the brother said, no, um, these words are going to be used all through school and you're just going to have to keep changing it. Don't put in kindergarten, just put school. And he was right. So I took out preschool and I took out kindergarten and I just made it school. Um, he also came to me and said, you know what, we need it. We talk about monsters in our house all the time. He needs Yeti and Dragon and Loch Ness Monster. And, you know, these are not things I would ever think of to put into a speech device. But the sibling was right and we put it in. Um, you know, the hot words to say, like, um, you know, the kids used to say epic. I don't think they say that anymore. But when something was cool, they would say epic or epic fail if something was bad. You know, asking siblings what words need to be in there. And then you can teach older siblings how to program, how to add a quick word, how to, um, how to back up the system, uh, you know, give them a role in helping their siblings. Almost always they appreciate it and they want to be part of that. Um, that top picture there where you see a girl with Rhett and her Toby, um, and that was taken many, many years ago, and her brother playing with some stuffed animals, you know, and she's wearing her brother's Yoda hat. Mom came downstairs and caught them playing like this. This wasn't an adult setup. You know, he wanted to play with his sister, so he did. Um, and he had been empowered to do that by, you know, being told, use the Toby, invite your sister, listen to what she says. Um, so siblings can be such an important part of the process of bringing AAC home. And then you need to think about um, light, mid, or backup technology. You know, if you have this high-tech system, and I know not everybody does, but if you do, you still need a backup system. So that could be spelling boards or a spelling flip book. If your daughter spells or does some spelling, it can be paper-based books or core word books. It can be their older system. You know, a lot of uh, older girls have moved from a Toby C series to a Toby I series. You can keep the C series, you know, and keep it in good condition, and then you have it if the I series breaks. You know, voice output switches, those buttons that you program to play a message, you can have those around for some communication stuff. Remember with those, though, the girl should make a choice, and then you make it their voice. They should always have a say on what's programmed on the button. It should never be a surprise. Um, having an iPad that is uh, programmed with something similar or identical to your daughter's system that you can do partner-assisted scanning with, um, where you know you touch each button and say, is this what you want, is this what you want, is this what you want, can be a great way to communicate on the go if you can't bring that eye gaze computer with you. Um, so a universal rule about these um, high-tech systems is they will break. They will. No one company has devices that break more than other companies. They're all the same. They all break. Um, and there are some places where high-tech just isn't a great idea. For example, on a boat in the middle of the Gulf of Florida, um, of the Gulf of Mexico off Florida. So you need to have a plan for when this happens. And it's helpful if you have that plan before it happens. What will you use? Where will you use it? How will we implement it? You know, will your child know how to use it before you need it? Um, and sort of really thinking about what is your light tech or backup system? Um, where are you going to keep it? And practicing with it before you need it. Let's talk really briefly about what makes somebody a competent AAC user. And the reason I bring this up is because people think so frequently that like the ability to make choices is all their child needs to be able to do with their device um, and then their communicator. But um, the work of Janice Light tells us that that's not true. To be a competent communicator, your child needs to have a social and pragmatic skills like greeting and saying goodbye, taking turns, staying on topic. And remember, they don't have to do all of these things high tech. If your child greets by making eye contact and can wave goodbye or blink goodbye, then those things count. Uh, your child should have some operational skills. 
you know, can you give them a way to turn it on and off themselves? The newest Toby devices do have wake on gaze. Can you teach your child how to wake, use wake on gaze? Can your child control their volume, turn it up and down for different settings? Um, can they adjust their settings? I like to give the girls access to adjust their own dwell time. Uh, you know, I give them three preset dwell times with the middle one being the one they usually use and then a faster and a slower so that they can go in and make it faster and slower. Do they know how to program their own device? If they, you know, spell a word, do they know how to then add that word to a button? I mean, then there's the linguistic and language piece. Do they understand language? What's the receptive language like? And for our girls, it's usually pretty good. What's their vocabulary? Are they able to use grammar? You know, after a few years of using their device, it's going to be time to start thinking about grammar and word order. Um, you know, and you'll, you'll say to yourself, oh my gosh, I never thought we'd get here, but it's time to talk about word order. Um, and then strategic. You know, how do you know when somebody doesn't get it? And then what do you do to fix those mistakes? You know, if a girl really has something to tell and doesn't have the words on their system, do they know how to figure out a way to tell? Do, do they have a way to say, you know, take a guess, I'll tell you if you're hot or cold. Um, not on this page is also um, another competency that was added by um, Buchelman, which is self-talk. So tell, we all self-talk constantly, all day. Most of us do it in our heads, but some of us do it out loud. Um, and that's the ability to, to reason with ourselves. To say, uh-oh, slow down on the highway. There, sometimes there's a speed trap around this corner. Or to be thinking, you know, tonight for dinner, I can make this or I can make this because that's what I have in the fridge. Um, so having your child able to do that with their device or in their head is important. And then for, I would add for our girls with Rett syndrome, the ability to direct their own care. I want to get dressed. Please wash my hair. I need my nails done. Um, you know, I don't want to wear those sneakers today. The ability to give directions. Um, you know, if they have a new nurse or a new caregiver at home or a new aide at school, can they say, you know, my bag goes on the first hook? Can they prevent and report if something terrible happens? Can they say, you know, don't touch me? Or can they go home and say, I'm scared of so-and-so? Um, and the ability to explain their needs and how they should be met. Do they have a way to say, you know, when I get tired, I shut my eyes? Or do they have a way to say, you know, I think I might be about to have a seizure. And a lot of girls with Rett syndrome can actually tell you with their devices when they're going to have a seizure. Um, but really thinking about those self-advocacy pieces. Um, my suggestion for all of you parents is when the school is writing their IEP goals for AAC use, you should have at least one goal in each of these areas. You should have, you know, student will improve AAC skills by demonstrating, um, by meeting the following benchmarks. And then you should have a social and pragmatic one that they'll stay on topic or take turns. They should have an operational one that they'll adjust their dwell time or change the volume based on the, on the volume of the room. Um, they should have language and linguistic, two word phrases, three word phrases, using the correct tense, using word order. They should have a strategic goal, you know, the ability to say you don't understand. Um, and then self-advocacy, they should have the ability to say, like, I need to be taken to the bathroom or um, it's time for me to go in the standard, or those sorts of things. I think if you think about each of these things in the IEP all of the child's life, hopefully by the time that they're ready to move to adult services, they'll have all of the skills they need to be as competent as they can be. We also need to think about AAC out in the world. One of the marvelous things that happens with AAC is other people get to see the girls for who we know they are. You know, in the bottom picture, you can see Madison talking to her doctor with her Toby in the doctor's office. Um, I know one young lady recently who was hospitalized for a long period of time and went to see her doctor after the hospitalization and with her Toby was able to say, you know, hospital, long time, I don't like it. Um, you know, and the doctor had to say, you know, I'm really sorry, you were there for a long time. Um, that same young lady is able to go to get her blood drawn and she's able to say, 
you need to blow the, draw the blood from this certain place. And then she's also able to say, three strikes and you're out. Or, I need a senior tech. Because we've really thought about how is she using her AAC in the world? And how can we empower her in situations where she feels vulnerable? But in, able to, in order to do that, we need to be able to mount or have access for the device somehow um, in every environment. So this is one of those things where it's actually a little bit easier if your daughter is in a wheelchair because you can mount it to the wheelchair and then you're pretty much good to go. Um, if your daughter is ambulatory, it's, it's a tougher thing to do, but figuring out how to carry it, if you need to carry a mount, how you're going to mount it. Um, you know, it should be easy enough to set up their system wherever you are. Um, if it's on a wheelchair, it should allow for transfers in and out of the wheelchair without removing the device if possible. So in that top picture, that mount swings up and under so the Toby can stay attached while the child is transferred in, and in, or, in or out of the chair. Um, putting on the mount and device should be part of every transfer or every arrival out of the car or van. And if you can train PCAs and siblings and family members that that is just what you do, it's as natural as putting on or taking off a coat, um, that that is the best thing you do, can do, make it a habit. You can also have a car with visual step-by-step -step instructions on how to set up a device on a mount. Um, here are some different pictures of kids using their AAC systems in the world. So in the top left picture, you can see Madison, who is also in the top right picture, um, with her Toby, and she on that picture is using her Toby um, Surface, which is the iMobile attached to a uh, Surface Windows um, tablet. But you can see it attached to the shopping cart. Um, and because she's ambulatory, this allows her to communicate in the environment. It's actually pretty tough for her to use it in the environment like that. She does need a little bit of help stabilizing herself, but she can do it. The middle picture shows that same device mounted into a cup holder um, so that she can communicate in the car. And it turns out she's actually pretty good about that. Um, in the bottom picture, you see Samantha and those pictures are taken several years apart. So in the first picture, she has her older Toby, and it's resting in a folding guitar stand because that was much lighter to carry than the mount was because she's in her stroller. And then in the picture on the right there where she's eating some orange leaf frozen yogurt, she has a new um, iMobile on a Dell tablet computer, and that is mounted with just a, a clamp onto her stroller. One of the stories that Samantha's mother um, tells is about how she always attaches Samantha's um, speech device, or Toby, no matter where they are or what they're doing, even if they're going somewhere like the state fair, where um, it's too sunny for her to see it and use it, um, even if they use like an umbrella, it's just too bright. But mom always sets it up because they can still do partner-assisted scanning, and people treat Samantha differently when she has her speech system in front of her. When she has her Toby, people talk to her. When she doesn't, people talk to her mom. So her mom has really made it part of who Samantha is. The device is always in front of her, even, even if she can't use it or has to use it with partner-assisted scanning. Um, you know, on the Practical AAC blog, which I hope you all follow, years ago they had um, a little meme that came up that said that um, expectations create opportunities and opportunities create achievement and achievement creates ex expectations and so on and so forth and um, making people expect Samantha to be a you know someone who communicates with this high-tech device means that they give her opportunities to communicate so um, it's a great sort of circle of improving her life just by having it present um, also at home you need to think about mounting. Think about all the different places your daughter is, whether she's ambulatory or not. Um, you know, if she's in a yogi bow like Madison is in that top picture, or a recliner like um, Francesca is in the bottom picture, how can she communicate from that place? Um, and it might be low tech, it might be high tech, but you know, thinking about mounting and setting it up so that your child can communicate no matter where she is. If she's spending two or three hours a day on the Yogi Bow because that's the most comfortable place to watch TV in the evening, it's not okay for two or three hours a day to be without communication. So you've got to find a way to set it up. 
I'm the same with Francesca and her recliner. She sits there a lot, but their previous mounting system didn't allow her to use her Toby from there. Um, so her family went out and got a different mounting system that does allow her to use her Toby from there. Um, so really thinking about carefully where your child is, you know, if they're in a stander, if they're in other equipment, how can you set up the environment so that they're able to communicate? So in the top right um, up here, you have Madison's two Tobies, and I just took this picture so you could see the two different mounts going on at the same time. So they have this podium laptop cart with a regular mount for the big Toby, and that's what she uses when she's sitting on the couch, which is over to the side. And then this lower one is what you saw over the Yogi Bow on the previous slide. Um, so either one can work for her so she can communicate either on the couch or on the Yogi Bow. And here you see Samantha again with her her Toby iMobile attached to a clamp and then we built a sunscreen over it a little bit to see if we could help with some of the glare issues. Here's Samantha in her stander with her older Toby on a rolling mount so she's able to be in the stander with her device and watch a slideshow. Her mom sent me this picture because she thought it was funny that Samantha was watching a slideshow, she and I. Um, but you can see how that mounting works so she can talk even in the stander. And many rec girls love their standers. Um, a lot of kids with cerebral palsy hate their standers, but many girls with RET love them. So making sure they can communicate really makes that a very functional time. You know, and here's Abby, and she's just sitting on the couch. And one of the things we had to do for Abby is really think about how could we get the device in a place where she would use it but still see the TV. And it had always been over to the side, and she wouldn't use it. So we tried this new lower angled position so she has to look down at her Toby. And that seems to work just a little bit better for her. But really thinking about all these different places in the living room, in the kitchen, you know, in the family room, you know, wherever you happen to be to make sure that they have access to their communication system. And then thinking about out in the world, you know, life is messy. So, you know, talk to your vendor about how to prevent scratches and, and spills with your device. You can get stick-on screen protectors like you would for an iPad. They come in all different sizes. Um, your Toby will still work just fine if you put a stick-on screen shield on it. You can even get ones that are low glare, which might be helpful for seeing it in bright lights or the sun. A gallon Ziploc bag and a little bit of duct tape and you can cover, as long as you don't cover the eye gaze portion if you're using eye gaze, you can cover it with a Ziploc bag and the device will work just fine. It'll prevent it from getting splashes of anything on it if you're doing cooking or if you're doing a, a messy art project or science experiment or something. Um, and what I always say is, you know, if the military can use computers in war and in the desert, then we can find ways for our AAC users to use their devices at lunch in the mall. Um, and of course, at the water park, it might be time to go low tech. Although, if somebody figures that out, send me a picture. And then thinking about AAC out in the world and new people. One of the wonderful things about um, the RET family out in the world is the purple card movement. So, so many girls have gone to Girl Power to Cure um, and have had purple cards made. I really encourage you to have something on the purple card about your daughter's communication so that you can give it to people out in the community so they understand what that big computer is in front of them. Um, below is a card that I used and made uh, for a child in a school. Um, and I just adapted a little in case people wanted to use it. So it just explains that they use a device to talk, read the card to yourself, because people seem to always want to read it out loud. Um, and it just explains that she stares at pictures on the screen and it speaks and to be patient. Um, if you're going to go out into the community, you know, having the cards to hand out can be really helpful. You're always going to have a mix of, you know, the people who stare, which is annoying and not helpful and the people who come and talk which is wonderful or ask questions about the device which is wonderful um you know so being ready to help those people and make the world a better place for your daughter to communicate and it is fantastic you want to make sure you worry about the volume before you go in um if you're using 
one of the iMobile devices or a similar uh, or an iPad or something like that. You might need an external speaker to be loud enough to be heard in some places. Um, and then, you know, you can do things like prep people ahead of time. If you go to the same pharmacy, um, you know, every time you get medicine and they know you by name because you're in there all the time, then maybe talking to them ahead of time and saying, next time we come in, my daughter is going to pick up her prescriptions herself. So she's going to come in, she's going to use her talker, just put the prescriptions on her tray and you know, or put the bag in her hand and have them ready and then have your daughter try it. Go in, set up a page that has a really giant button that says their name um, and then the things they might need to say, their address or birth date, depending on the pharmacy. And, and let her try to pick up her own, her own prescriptions or let her try to place her own order at a restaurant. Um, and then always have a set of one-liners ready for you. Um, like one of the things I always say when people look at me when the child has a speech device is don't look at me I just push the wheelchair um, and throw up my hand so people are sort of forced to to go into the interaction with the child instead of with me but if you sort of prep the world a little bit you know later when your daughter is more independent and not on her own she'll have lots more opportunities because we've done the work now. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and have a great rest of the day or night or whatever it is where you are. Thanks.